All right, good evening, good evening everyone. Um, I'm happy to hear, be here tonight with all of you. My name is Tom Giroux. I am uh, a board member for the Forest History Association of the, uh, Wisconsin. And I'm pleased to be here with Donald Schnitzler, who's gonna be talking about the association and all the uh, good things about it. And so I'll let Donald talk a little bit more about himself and turn it over to him. So go ahead, Don. Thanks, Tom. Um, as Tom said, I, I'm a member, a board member of the Forest History Association. I've been involved with the association since 2009. Um, and I'm here tonight just kind of tell people, bring people up to speed about who the Forest History Association is and what we do. I've had the opportunity to go out and meet people from uh, at different events, uh, historical society meetings, uh, school programs where we take our historic banners and one of the comments that I hear most frequently is, you guys have to be the best kept secret around because I've never heard of you. And I'm hoping that when we get done tonight, that no one that listens to this webinar will be able to say that, that we'll cover enough information so you have a good idea of who we are and what we do. And I think the first thing we should do is kind of start off with that little saying at the bottom here is that we are dedicated to the discovery, interpretation, and preservation of the forest history legacy of the state of Wisconsin. Now that's a mouthful of words. And the thing that's important is it's, it represents the entire spectrum of forest history for the state. Yes, we're gonna talk about some of the early, uh, the pinery days, but it goes beyond that. It goes to pre-recorded history uh, to the present use of our forest and our forest products. And so it really is an all encompassing uh, organization or association regarding the state uh, natural resources, the forest. Uh, what I'd like to do tonight is kind of hit some main points. And I guess we'll start off with a little bit of the history of the association, who we are and when we started, things like that. Talk about what our mission is, uh, because part of our mission, a good part of our mission is met in annual conferences and webinars. We'll talk about those, the publications that the organization produces. And what's kind of exciting is we are moving into more e-sources, things that are available to people uh, via the web. Uh, now, during this time of COVID where there's a lot of places closed, those e-sources are important and we are taking some of our resources and making them available on our website so people can access them from home. And we'll talk about those. Then the last thing is that uh, we are in the process of planning our 2021 Forest History uh, Annual Conference. Uh, 2021 is the 150th anniversary of the Peshtigo fire. And so the conference is planned to uh, actually land on the 150th anniversary, October 8th, uh, 2021, and we'll be meeting in Peshtigo for that. And we'll tell you, fill you in a little bit more later. All right. And then again, I mentioned that it was one of the state's best kept secrets, or that's what I've been told. And so what I wanted to do is start off by sharing two important addresses. The first one is for our website, www.forest history, association, all one word with the uh, abbreviation WI at the end and then .com. That will take you to our, our website and there's lots of information that is available about us there. And then our email address, you can reach out to us anytime through the email address there, the FHAW, Forest History Association of Wisconsin at gmail.com. Both of those addresses will give you additional information uh, or at least provide links on how to get hold of people in the organization so that we can answer questions for you. So as far as the brief history goes, Forest History Association has actually been around 45 years. We're just completing our 45th year, going into uh, the 46th year of our existence. Uh, the organization started planning uh, what what would what could they do to celebrate the uh, centennial anniversary of the country? And so in 1975, a group of, of people from the community from around the state 
uh, educators from the universities, uh, forestry people from the DNR, uh, woodland owners, people who worked in forest product industry, got together and started talking about this organization and made it come to reality in 1976. The first meeting was held at Rhinelander. And since then, every year, we've held an annual conference uh, sometime in August, September, or October uh, of each year to celebrate uh, forest history, uh, to, to, to document things that have happened in the past. And it could be that those things are related to the pinery, could be uh, glacier time, it could be forest products, uh, it could be anything related to the forest industry. Uh, two of the ones that pop in my head, uh, a couple of years ago, 2018, we were in Wood County uh, and one of the conversations or presentations had to deal with cranberries. Uh, 2019, we were in Black River Falls and one of the presentations had to do with the sphagnum moss industry. And so it's, it's forest products and forest related products that end up being uh, talked about. Since that time, we've gone through and talked about what the mission of the organization is supposed to be. And we'll talk a little bit about that, but it's kind of, um, we like to use these, these little phrases or little words, inform, educate, archive, and publish to talk about the mission of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. The first one, inform, really has to do with just promoting an interest in forest history among the people in the state of Wisconsin, uh, people who are writers or scholars, so that they know a little bit more about the history of forestries and the forests and forest products. Uh, one of the ways we do this is by taking our traveling exhibit and setting up at different events. Uh, in the picture on the top, you can see John Grossman, our pa uh, past president. Uh, and I think he was set up at Forest Fest in Eagle River uh, a couple of years ago for that. And then we had uh, uh, another past president that was the president that was involved with creating the Wisconsin Flying Trees exhibit. And uh, that is a, a shown there. And then someone is being interviewed or talked about uh, talked to about uh, how the Wisconsin forest products were used during World War II uh, to fight in the war. So did you know that the mosquito bomber, for example, was made out of birch from the state of Wisconsin? And so there's lots of, of opportunities that we use banners and displays to go out and just promote an interest in uh, the forest history of the state. We also talk about educate, getting a little bit more formal. And one of the best ways, well, some of the best ways that we have of providing this education is through our annual conferences. Usually we have uh, people uh, who are very knowledgeable speakers come in and talk about different aspects of Wisconsin forest or Wisconsin forest history events. Uh, or products in the forest. And so what you see is that we take those opportunities or use those opportunities to share a little bit more in-depth education uh, related to those events. This webinar series that we're starting again for 2021 is another example of our opportunity or our ability to promote education related to forest history. And we'll talk about the upcoming webinars that are going to be presented and give you an idea of who some of those presenters will be. We also use the word archive uh, because it's very important to find some of these records before they are lost. And, and back in 1975 and 76, this was one of the purposes uh, that the organization, the original founders of the organization thought was important. And they've been doing this or we've been doing this since 1976. You'd think that in the last 40 years, we would have found all the materials that needed to be preserved and taken to the archives and made them available for people to do research with. But we still are finding things and people are still bringing things forward. And so our archives uh, is still growing 
And we actually take uh, print materials and things to the UW Stevens Point Regional Archives on the fifth floor, and they hold our physical archives. And right now we have about five boxes of things in one member's basement that are scheduled to go over there. And then another box of things from uh, actually from my house uh, that will be going over there to be archived. And those archives are again available for people to use. If you look at the pictures here, uh, the lower picture is actually the reading room at the archive. Uh, the stacks in the back are what the, the things are stored in, uh, in the back. And it's set up so that we don't go in and do our own uh, pulling of materials. Uh, they will ask or have a page come out, ask you what you need. Uh, the student page will go back in the uh, stacks, find the material that you requested, bring it out to you in the reading room for you to use. And so it's, it's very convenient. Uh, right now, the archives, because of COVID, is closed, and so we can't get in there right now. But there's quite a nice collection of things that are available from the Forest History Association in person at the archives. We also have members who have been uh, investing uh, their life work in collecting things, and some of those members have already made donations. For example, uh, Jack Valier was a past member of the Forest History Association. Uh, prior to his passing, he donated 3,000 uh, original photographs of logging pictures or logging scenes or people that were involved with lumbering uh, to the Forest History, excuse me, they, he donated them to the archives at the UW Stevens Point. Uh, and again, it just enriches the forestry collection that's there. And those also are available for individuals to search. Um, and then there's people that, that are still working on their life work. Frank Hitz is uh, the gentleman in this picture. He's been working on a database of historical sawmills at least for 20 years. Uh, and I, I can't begin to explain how much information that he has, but he's working closely with another member of the association to make sure that those records are preserved somewhere and somehow. Now, as far as the archives go, again, I mentioned that it's housed at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. It's on the fifth floor. Uh, there are seven boxes of information uh, on are in that collection right now for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. About half of those have been digitized. Uh, the archivist is currently working at digitizing those materials because the, the place is closed because of COVID. And so they've been working to get that material digitized and then they will be moving them uh, to some platform uh, where they can be available for people to research at home. We're also taking, as I mentioned, those uh, things that are in our collection, things that have either been donated recently or were put into the storage unit. We're taking those things and moving them now to the archives so they also can be indexed. One of the goals is to take, and we're working with other organizations to do this, uh, the Hall of Fame nomination papers and get all of those into the archives so that they are available for people to research uh, the Hall of Fame nominees and uh, uh, inductees to the Hall, Forestry Hall of Fame uh, through the uh, regional archives at Stevens Point. Uh, and then besides the archives that's available through the UW Stevens Point, we're also making available on our website uh, additional information so that it's available for people to research. And we will talk to you a little bit about that in just a minute. And of course, if someone has something that they believe should be in the archives, I would encourage you to reach out to us so that we can help facilitate taking it to the Stevens Point archives and making it available for researchers in the future. Uh, the last of our inform uh, educate, archive, and publish is the word publish. And the Forest History Association uh, has for, since our creation or our organization back in 1975, assisted people with the publication and distribution of works related to the forest. 
Uh, this book, for example, is, is a good example. Uh, a forest history member and a professor uh, from one of the universities in the southern part of the state uh, put together a history of vanished lumber towns. And with financial support from the association, uh, the book was published and made available uh, to everyone. Um, and it, it, it actually was an award-winning book. Uh, it was recognized by the State Historical Society. And Randall Rowe, who was a pub, uh, the editor and the writer, uh, was recognized for his works on that. So we do assist with publication uh, when there's works that are available. And if there's funds available, there's all, it's always considered on an individual basis. One of the things we talk about when we're talking with groups uh, about the history of the Forest History Association and what we're trying to do is uh, something that Chief Seattle said is all things are bound together and all things connect. And when we talk about forest history, forest history really connects with a lot of other uh, oh, Individuals, we're not in a, in, a, in a vacuum when it comes to looking at the forest history. Uh, we have people who are members of the Forest History Association because they have connections to uh, families who are involved with logging or logging history. We have other people who are involved because they were involved with forestry, forestry or logging today. Others are interested in the history of Wisconsin. Um, the family historians are somebody you wouldn't think about being interested in necessarily the logging history, but it's an important part of their efforts when they're researching things to kind of track down all the records they can. And so they have an interest in some of the things that we are collecting and assembling and making available to other people. Uh, one of the things about the association is we don't work, as I said, in a vacuum. Uh, the association works with local historical societies, other organizations that are uh, connected to the Wisconsin woods or forestry, conservation efforts. So it's all things are connected and we are just one small part of that connection and doing what we can to make these records available. One of the ways, the principal ways that we share the history of the state of Wisconsin is through our annual fall conferences. Uh, and as I mentioned, we usually do those August, September, October, sometime in those three months. Uh, and every year we gather at a different location in the state. On uh, this particular day, there was probably about 20, 25 people uh, at that event. Uh, and they come from all across the state, actually, uh, there's a Minnesota person in that group too. So we, we attract a number of people who are members. Some of them are also non-members. We, we promote these as open events and encourage people who are not members to also join us. So as far as the locations go, uh, we move, or the plan is to move the annual conference around the state. You know, One year it's up north, another year it's off on the east side of the state. Another year it's on the west side of the state, more centrally located, and then uh, occasionally southern part of the country or of the state. Uh, the southern part of the state is probably visited less frequently because most of the time we're talking about uh, north of Highway 64 in the area kind of described as being the pinery. And so we do move around the states. And as we move around the state, uh, we reach out to the local historical societies or local organizations in the area to help us plan the most informative and best conference possible. When it comes to the conferences, the typical structure, and I don't know if typical is really the right word, everything, every presentation or every conference is actually structured uh, based to fit the area where you're at. But typically we try to arrange the conferences so they're two or three days long. Uh, they include lectures, tours of interesting, uh, either businesses, uh, historical sites, uh, museums, 
and then we have our general membership meeting because we have to have an elections every year or, yeah every year and one of the things that uh, members have always talked about is it's it's important to have just time to kind of sit and visit because a lot of these people have become very good friends over the years so if you look at these pictures we've got uh, i think it's paul delong uh, from uh, department of natural resources giving a lecture uh, we have a retired school teacher uh, in the lower picture who uh, helped or guided a group of people. Up, this was this year up at Manitowish Waters uh, to the top of a hill so they could look at the foundation from uh, the original fire tower that was there and talk a little bit about the history of that fire tower. And then um, the picture on the left is taken over by Goodman, Wisconsin. Uh, it was a, a civilian conservation corps project and uh, we toured that area and uh, then posed for a picture after the conference or after the presentations. A lot of times we have lectures and lectures are presented in a variety of places. Libraries are good resources to use for the uh, lecture presentation. Uh, we also did uh, a nature conservancy. Uh, the Mead Wildlife Area in central Wisconsin provided the classroom. Uh, the, the technical school in Anago provided a classroom in the upper right hand picture. Probably the most unique place we've met that I can think of is in a uh, repurposed barn. And this is the lower level of a barn on the bottom picture. And so we gather together and we meet in different locations and uh, have experts on a variety of subjects come in and talk about different aspects of forest history or just forestry in general. The other, another part of the annual conferences are tours and tours, again, uh, it, it's always interesting to see what uh, the planners for the conferences come up with for tours. But as we go into different locations, we uh, seek out or look for uh, different opportunities to share forest history with uh, the members and people who attend. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, we were in Anago that year. Uh, Al Keppel was a state, I uh, was a forester for the Kretz Lumber Company. They have an industrial forest. And so he provided a tour of the industrial forest with, with different things that they do to manage that uh, woods. And then Troy Brown, who is the president of the Kretz Lumber Company, took us back through the sawmill uh, in this picture in particular, we're in, a, uh, in by the kilns where they dried the lumber and he was take, took a piece out and was explaining the process to us. Uh, the picture in the upper left, uh, we were down at Southwood County Historical Society, Wisconsin Rapids, and their president, Philip Brown, uh, took us on a tour of the uh, museum and the, and the former home. And then uh, because we have a, a number of older members that join us, uh, the Mead Wildlife actually prepared a, a, a wagon trip. Uh, one of the things that's good about our organization uh, when we get together for these things is that um, the programs are tailored for the needs of the members or the people who sign up. And so this took us for a couple miles into the Mead Wildlife via a uh, wagon ride. Uh, and provided an opportunity for people to see things. Uh, and then the, the picture at the top was 2017, the association uh, met at Menominee, Wisconsin. Uh, the Mabel Tainter uh, Theater is there. This is actually a, a photograph of the Mabel Tainter, Tainter Theater. One of the things nice about getting these special tours is you get a lot of uh, looks behind the scenes. And so they were opening doors and cupboards and walls showing us just about everything you can imagine uh, in this. It's not just a shot of, of um, the way the auditorium looks, it's behind the scenes type information, which makes the tours very beneficial. It's also a time when we present our annual awards. The Forest History Association has three different awards that they give out. 
Uh, the FIXMER uh, Distinguished Service Award is given to an individual for outstanding contributions either to the organization or to Forestry in general. You do not have to be a member to receive that award. Uh, and and uh, in the, this case, the upper right hand picture, uh, 2019, Dan Giese, one of the Forest History members actually did receive the award from John Grossman. Uh, the next award is the Miles Benson President's Award. Uh, in the square picture there, uh, I'm giving the award to uh, Bob Walkner. And I see I spelt his name wrong in the caption, but Bob Walkner is um, or has been one of our uh, mainstays for the organization. He's probably been involved with the organization for 14, 15 years uh, on the board. Uh, he is the face of the organization when it comes to talking to members. And then the Connor Distinguished Service Award is an award that's given to uh, an organization or an association. In this case, uh, in 2015, uh, Sarah Connor is presenting the award to Troy Brown and Al Keppel, again, from the Kretz Lumber Company. And they were recognized for the things that they do with Forest History Day and with the managed forest that they use for teaching purposes. So, uh, so we give out three awards every year or can give out, out up to three awards every year. And uh, those are typically done during the annual meeting. We also have, as I mentioned, social time and, and uh, social time takes precedent over some, some things, but you can see that we like to gather in different settings. Uh, the lower picture is down in Black River Falls and just one of the local bars and, and saloons and uh, they provide a really good meal. Uh, the picture above was over in Menominee, Wisconsin. It's a private dining and museum uh, where they opened it up for us and they gave a program on, on their collection. And uh, again, it was just a nice opportunity to sit and talk and visit uh, together and meet the people that own the build, building. And then uh, down in the lower left hand corner is uh, another board member, Arno Helm, uh, looking at a uh, publication. One of the things that we do every year at our annual conferences is to raise funds either for scholarships or, or to, to build the uh, accounts that sustain the organization. Um, is have an auction. You can see on the two tables in the upper pictures, the two portrait size pictures, uh, some of the types of things that come in to be auctioned off uh, to the members uh, as a fundraiser for the association. So one of the things about all of these events is that we make connections there and those connections really help us kind of recognize that we're only a small cog in the whole forest history picture. And so uh, Gina Bellman says, I really love those connections that make this big old world feel like a little village. And one of the things about the Forest History Association with our connections is that we are just a small piece of all the other forest organizations in the state. So wanted to kind of take a uh, switch gears here and move to our website a little bit, kind of to give an overview of what's available on our website. And so again, if you didn't write down the address before, Forest History Association, wi.com is the web address for our site. And this is what it looks like when you log in there. And we'll just kind of quickly go through and talk about some of the things that you will find there. Uh, First off, if you click on the about, it'll bring up, um, I take that back. This is the uh, homepage yet. At the bottom of the homepage, uh, you will see the webinars from the past year. Uh, during 2020, uh, our annual conference at the last minute was switched from being an in-person conference to a uh, webinar only. And there were eight lectures that were scheduled to be presented for that uh, uh, conference. 
They were all converted into a webinar format uh, over a course of a couple months time. The speakers came in and talked via webinars and gave their presentations so we could share them with the public. Uh, those are still housed on our website. So anyone who wants to learn about one of the topics, uh, greater detail about the topics is more than welcome to go to the site, click on it and watch those webinars as if you were present when they were originally given. It's also a chance to look and see what kind of uh, topics are covered during the conferences. If you look, you've got things on wildlife, Native Americans, you've got um, um, the fire towers, uh, hemlock logging, uh, uh, forest history, or excuse me, the forest, school forest program, and then the trees for tomorrow program. So we try to cover a variety of topics I missed the Thunder, Rate, uh, Thunder Lake narrow gauge railroad, but there's a variety of topics that are covered every at every conference and it's to really kind of uh, give a broader view to people who are in attending so that everybody finds something that they're interested in. If we go to the about uh, uh, I, on the cross the top, um, you'll find uh, about and it takes you to this page and it kind of talks about who we are again. And uh, again, it's com committed to discovery, interpretation, preservation of forest history, but it also again hits those bullet points that we try to accomplish with our mission of informing, educating, archive and publishing different things connected to the forest history of Wisconsin. And if you scroll down below that, it will take you to the names of all the officers and directors. Now, last year during our annual meeting, we increased the size of the board. Uh, at this time, the Forest History uh, Board of Directors is can have up to 12 people on it. We only have 10 at the time. Uh, so there's room for a couple of, of people. If there's someone is interested in getting involved with the organization, uh, send us an email through that the Forest History, the FHAW at gmail.com address, and we'll be glad to talk to you about that. Second uh, icon across that header is upcoming events. And this is gonna be changing real quickly because uh, the upcoming events are being developed. One of them we mentioned is that uh, there is the annual fall conferences uh, coming up. Again, that will be held October 7th through the 9th in Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Uh, they, the committee, uh, and the part of the committee is shown in the picture at the bottom is actually meeting now. Uh, they have a meeting tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, to work out some more details about the conference. I would expect that within a month, uh, the whole lineup of presentations uh, and the day to day activities will be set. But right now, it's just in the works. But we can mark the date as October 7th through the 9th at Peshtigo uh, for the in person conference. There will also be a couple of, of pre-conference uh, presentations given during this forest history talk uh, that lead up to the webinars or to the uh, conference itself. In August and September, three webinars will be presented on, on things related to the Peshtigo fire. One of them is the weather conditions at the time, uh, increased Lapham. Uh, and uh, the fire paradigm is one of them. the titles. Are, I don't have all the titles yet, but uh, I know that the uh, one presenter is from the University of Arizona and he'll be talking about the weather conditions that led up to the fire. That final schedule will be out shortly. So if you get a chance or want to check back on this page of events, you'll see the annual meeting or the annual conference uh, schedule listed here. And you'll also find the updated list of talks once those are finally finalized. You'll also be able to find that same information on our Facebook page. Now, as far as publications go, the Forest History Association actually does three publications. Uh, again, the idea is to inform and educate. And so the three publications that go out, the first is what's referred to as Wood chips. It's a um, monthly electronic newsletter. 
and if we click on wood chips, it brings you this. Over on the right hand side here, you see 2021 newsletters. Every month as the, the issues come out, uh, they're linked here and you can click on, just click there and it will open up a PDF of the wood chips. And wood chips is basically set up to be a collection of things that are in the news at this time or a video or something related to logging history. Now, in this particular issue, when I look at it, you can see we have Michigan mentioned here and Minnesota here. While we talk about Wisconsin history, we also recognize that we're part of the Great Lakes states and the Great Lakes states logging industry was very similar. And so there are things that we share between us. And sometimes you'll see things from Michigan or Minnesota show up in our uh, wood chips newsletter. The other things that are in there are local, are not necessarily local history, but current events, things that are being reported now. Uh, and so you can see different things that might uh, show up in a typical wood chips. And when you look at these, uh, we have here we have the 2021, 2020, 2019, and 2018. You can open those up and actually get links to the previous issues. They'll stay there for a while. When it comes to the quarterly newsletter, we have a, a quarterly print newsletter called Chips and Sawdust. This is actually delivered to members as both electronic version or print version. And like the wood chips, you can see over here, the 2020 newsletters are all there yet. We haven't published our first 2021. It's coming in a month or so. And you can click on the link and it will open up uh, that particular issue of the newsletter. If you're interested in past newsletters, you can go over and click on one of these icons and it will open up a list of the newsletters that are available for that particular time. Now, newsletters have always been published and shared with members either electronically or, or, or as a print format only. Uh, we've started to archive them on the website. And so you can see what's in a newsletter. Uh, this is what people would get with the print version or the electronic version. But as I mentioned, we started to record these things or to, to archive them on our website so people can use them as a resource. And just to give you an example, uh, you want to search for something specific to the chips and sawdust, and there's 20 years worth of chips and sawdust on the website now. The other 20 plus years are coming. Uh, but if you want to see if there's anything in there, and I just picked out one name for as an example, if you put the name in quotations marks, it keeps the name together. So it's going to look up for, for specifically Alex Simpson and specifically within chips and sawdust. And what it does is that narrows the search down very close and it looks like there's not a lot of matches. But if you look like this, sandwiched in between these two uh, hits is the Forest History Association of Wisconsin newsletter. And it specifically highlights Alex Simpson's name. And this is the 2011 newsletter that was published. Um, and it doesn't take you to the exact page. You have to, once you get to it, you have to scroll through the, the, uh, the newsletter by hand, but you'll see that Alex Simpson is listed in there. So what's kind of nice about being able to archive, the, archive these newsletters uh, onto our own website is that uh, they are being indexed so people can actually find information. So if you have a relative uh, who you knew was involved with the logging industry, this was back in the, I'd have to go to a previous issue, but it was sometime in the uh, late 1800s, uh, talking about the log drivers on, on the Wisconsin River, if I remember right. Uh, you can actually turn up specific names for individuals. We're gonna be doing the same thing uh, with our, our proceedings, I missed a page here or something didn't work here, but the next icon over to the chips and sawdust was the proceedings. And historically, the association has published uh, proceedings of the annual meeting every year. 
and we have from 1976 to 2008. In 2008, there was a break, and then again in 2018, we started again. Uh, but those are also going to be added as individual links on our website. At the present time, when you go to that link, it takes you to the State Historical Society. Uh, this links us to specifically the 1996 to 2006 proceedings. There's a 10 years worth of them put together. Uh, and you can see an example of some of the things that are included into a proceedings. This has the history of Lady Smith logging on the Flambeau River, Daniel Shaw Lumber Company, Russ County logging roads, a history of the Flambeau River State Forest. Gives you an idea of what some of the contents would be. And as you scroll down here, every time, you went, for example, if you got to the 22nd annual meeting, 1997, you click on it, it would open up and tell you what is included in that issue. Through the Wisconsin Historical Society, you can actually search for uh, Wisconsin or the forest history logging material by going to Turning Points Wisconsin and then look for the forest history Wisconsin proceedings. And there's three sets that are available on that website. It's just a matter of, again, looking for turning points of Wisconsin history and then selecting logging. But in the near future, you'll be able to do it from here and we'll do it that way. Going on to the other publications that are out there, and this is just kind of real quick uh, mentioned here is that we had a, a member of the association, Paul Brenner, who spent a great deal of time going through and indexing uh, the log marks uh, used here in Wisconsin in the late 1800s. And what he did was he gave us a, a complete set of the index that he created. It's 424 pages. Uh, and then his family, uh, a niece, actually reached out to us and gave us a couple more copies in the last year or two that will be taken over to the uh, archives at Stevens Point. But we scanned them all, made them available so people can use them from home. So if you click on a letter, let's just say A, it will open up a page or a set of pages, 1 to 13, that you can scroll through and look at them. And so in this case, all of these log marks start with the letter A. And over in uh, the second column, it tells you whether it was an end mark or if it was a bark mark. It will tell you when it was recorded or registered and then who the owner of that mark was. And so Smith, Abraham, and Lee is a logging company, Atwood Lumber and Manufacturing Company. So the list goes through and gives you the name of the people that were using that particular log mark. And, and 424 pages, a lot of information there to go through. Besides that, we have uh, the next item over is the Ghost of the Forest. I mentioned that Ghost of the Forest was a publication that the Forest History Association supported uh, its publication. Uh, and I also mentioned that it was uh, one of the award winners from the State Historical Society. And you can see that here. This is the book. And if you want to see a few sample pages, you can open it up and you can scroll down. And I think there's a half a dozen to eight uh, different pages that are shown. You can get an idea of what the book looks like. And if you like what you see and you want to order a copy, they're still available. And you can print out this form and then send it to Randy and he'll get you a copy for yourself. It is really a well done publication. The other links for publications right now are the History of the Nicolay National Forest. This is another one of those uh, publications that the association helped sponsor. Uh, Ken Elliott was the, uh, well, he was a member of the Forest History Association when we were first organized. And he was also involved with the Nicol Nicolay National Forest. And his first book was, or his book was The History of the Nicolay Forest, 1928 to 1976. And again, you can scroll down here and look at all 80 pages of the book and read the book online if you'd like. And the same thing is true for E.M. Griffith's early story of Wisconsin. It's on there, it's in digital form, and you can read the entire book. And then about two years ago, one of our members, uh, this is Dan Giese, uh, had a collection or has had a catalog 
specifically connected to lumber and hardware supplies. And it was from 19, oh shucks, I don't remember the year now, 1913 or 1915. Anyway, um, on the inside, you can see some of the different tools that are used for lumbering or the logging industry or table saw for build contractors. Uh, get an idea of how much some of those items cost. It, it's, it's there and you can page through the whole thing uh, at home, uh, at your leisure, without cost. We also have, as we've been going through archives, have been turning up some other things. And so there's a series of four state force reports, uh, 1906 or 1908 to 1912. I think this the first annual report is the one on the back and the fourth one is the one on top. Those will be um, placed on the website soon. And then also uh, a publication that was done in the 1950s on forest fires, forest fire control in Wisconsin. Uh, and that will be available also so people can use it from the comfort of their home. And then. We have the next uh, header over as for collections. And in the collections, you can see uh, photo collections. We've got photos, a really nice collection of Menominee logging camp photos, and then the Rhinelander logging museum photos that people can go through and look at there. And uh, if you scroll down a little bit, uh, you can see our, again, our eight videos that are archived from last year's webinar series. Those will soon go to our YouTube channel and uh, be stored there. And the new 2021 uh, Forest History Conference webinars will be placed on the website. Then the other thing about the website is we, we invite members. Um, I, don't wanna, I didn't wanna make this a, a hard sell membership thing, but if you're interested in learning more about the Forest History Association, I encourage you to go to the website and then we have uh, a page on here for the membership uh, that if you want to join, uh, you can join the Forest History Association. Uh, you'll see that our membership dues are relatively inexpensive. Um, fortunately, we've got, uh, we, we've been very lucky with uh, support from members to make things happen. And so we're able to provide our memberships at relatively low cost. And you can sign up and register online, or you can print a membership form and send a check into our treasurer. And then the last uh, thing across that header is the contact. Uh, again, there's a mailing address there, so you can contact the Forest History Association uh, with a written letter or the email addresses there that you can copy and send an email, or you can fill in a note and send it through the website and it will come to the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Okay, this is taking you back to the, the about page and I just wanted to scroll down and this footer is actually on the bottom of all of the different pages of the website. But for practical purposes, I, I use this one. Uh, down in the lower left corner, there's two icons. One is for the Facebook page and one is for the YouTube channel. And if you click on the Facebook page, it will take you to the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's uh, Facebook page. You can see that as we go through and get more information about the upcoming conference, we're adding it there so people are aware of it. Uh, if you want to stay informed, uh, you can click like or follow. And as things are posted to the Forest History Association, you'll receive a notification so that you're kept informed about upcoming events and conferences. The other uh, icon down at the lower corner was to our YouTube channel. And I was gonna count the number of channels. There, there's a, a probably 50 or 60 videos, well, maybe more than that now, that are already uh, available for people to view on the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's YouTube channel. Uh, different conferences have been, uh, the presentations have been video recorded, edited, and then put up as YouTubes. And then just recently, we received a couple of historical documents. Uh, actually, this one went up two days ago. 
uh, story in smoke. Uh, story in the smoke is a, a promotional piece about the emergency fire wardens from the 1950s. 27 minutes long, and at least four people have found it since I posted it. So, so what what else do we need to talk about? One of the things I wanted to mention, uh, just again to emphasize, we like to get the message out about what the association does so that uh, we are not one of the best kept secrets anymore. And so along with that mission of inform, educate, archive and publish, uh, if anyone is interested in sharing information about the Forest History Association or using our information for events that you have locally, something that would tie into forest history, we have what we call our traveling exhibit that is available to borrow to people. Uh, it's been uh, associated with uh, logging events. It's been in libraries, uh, school programs, in the schools, in uh, history days, um, things with third grade, fourth grade, uh, you name it. Uh, if people can find a use for it, we'd be glad to help arrange to make those available to people to use. There are actually nine panels. Uh, the first eight match, and you can see five of the first eight in this photograph, uh, but the historical logging in Wisconsin, the logging terms at the camps, in the forest, and the mills. And then the other one is on the waterways as wood floats from cut over to sustained forestry. And then the ninth panel, uh, which is slightly different, uh, is on Wisconsin uh, World War II wartime wood products. Those are all available for uh, use by individuals, by members. Uh, to share the history of forestry and the value of the forest for Wisconsin. Um, here's a couple shots. Uh, the one, uh, the top picture was actually the banners went to De Pere uh, for a forest, uh, for a, a school history day, uh, a historic preservation month activity in May, a couple years ago. You can see the school kids looking at it. And I don't know if that was a teacher or a chaperone uh, kind of pointing out pictures and talking about things. Banners also have been uh, shared at the State Historical Conference. And you can see a couple people out here looking at them in the hall, looking at uh, the information that's on them. And again, as I said, the pa panels are available. We'd like to see them out and about. So if someone has an event uh, that they would like to reserve them for, just send an email to the Forest History Association at that email address or give me a call and we'll see if we can make arrangements to get them, uh, uh, set them aside for you. So one of the things that I think is important uh, is that with this association, we depend a lot on connections. We work with different groups uh, that are also related to Wisconsin Forest, uh, the School Forest Program, uh, Woodland Owners Association, local historical societies, state historical societies. There's a number of groups that help us with our connections. And because of those connections, things happen. And what's nice, I think, when things are happening together is that everyone benefits. And so if anyone has any interest in working with us to promote forest history in Wisconsin, uh, we'd be glad to uh, make, thing, make that happen with you. So with that, I think I'm gonna stop and ask if there's any questions. Uh, Tom, I can't hear you. That dreaded uh, mute button again. Yes. The clock. I just wanted to say that the way I was introduced uh, to Don Snitzler was at a family history conference where the panel was up. And since uh, my family was involved in logging, I was attracted to it and got information and then joined uh, the Forest History Association. So uh, those panels are a big uh, attractant. And, and a good way to educate, which is one of our uh, things that we do. So, um, so some questions from this chat here. What are some of the connections that the Forest History Association currently works with? 
Um, okay. Um, well, I mentioned the State Historical Society. Uh, we'll talk to one, one committee, for example, Archives Committee. We have people on the Archives Committee that are connected to the UW Stevens Point Archives, uh, the State Historical Society Archives, um, a local historical society up in Manitowish Waters, um, a history department at the UWSP. Uh, there's three board members from the Forest History Association, uh, another historical society uh, in Langlade County. So I guess I, what the way I'd answer that is that we have different committees or different activities in the association where we bring in people from uh, other groups that we can benefit each other as far as, as what we're doing. Uh, the archives, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to make things available and to find out what other people are doing to make their records available. So those would be some. Another one that pops in my head that I should mention is the LEAF program through UW Stevens Point. Um, LEAF program uh, is really involved with uh, the school force and teaching um, the grade school kids uh, about the forest and the value of the forest. And so the LEAF program is another group that we work with. So that's a perfect transition into the next question, which is I'm a middle school teacher. What type of resources would you have available uh, for me to use in the classroom? Well, there's the banners and, and, and actually the banners have gone to middle schools. Uh, during May, Historic Preservation Month tends to be the time when they're wanted the most for the schools. And that would be one opportunity for a school if they're looking for something that they can have set up for a week or something and share with their students. That would be one, one thing. Uh, I would suggest that if they don't uh, or aren't involved with uh, either the school force program or LEAF, that they reach out to LEAF for uh, some some guidance and help. And while we talk about LEAF, one of the projects that the Forest History Association has right now is we were given uh, a DVD that was created uh, about logging in the 1880s and 90s and early 1900s. Uh, it's 42 minutes long. It's too long for a, a, a classroom use to show the whole video. So we have a work study student or an intern uh, actually taking that video and breaking it into snippets and the school force people are creating lesson plans for incorporating into um, the classrooms. And so, again, I would start with LEAF and school forest uh, and then uh, see what else is available. And if they're looking for people to come in, uh, and that, this has been done too, where different people have taken artifacts and had like a show and tell day, uh, we can see what we could arrange with our members. Yeah, there's lots of really interesting people out there uh, that might be in your community or nearby your community that you could connect with and we could uh, make, that, make that connection happen. So besides the information you provide on your website, what other resources might you have, <coughs> excuse me, have available to share with local history societies? Okay, I guess one of the ways to look at that question has to do with, it, it depends on where you are. Uh, for the Pinery area, when you think about the northern half of the state, above Highway 64, for example, um, we probably have more things to share with that as far as historical material, uh, the artifacts, photographs, um, and literature. Uh, regarding those areas than we do the southern part of the state. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't have some things on the southern part of the state, um, but that would be one thing I would look at. Uh, uh, another thing, you know, when I think about our association, I have to tell you, I didn't come into the Forest History Association connected to forestry, uh, the forest industry. My great grandparents uh, were loggers. And so I, I, I kind of came into it from that aspect of people who worked in the forest industry. Um, but as far as having firsthand knowledge of it, 
I don't have a great deal of expertise in forest history, but I belong to an organization where the members, there are some amazing members in our group. Uh, there's a guy named Ray. Uh, uh, a couple of years ago, I got a phone call from uh, a new curator at a museum. She said, I just took over this job. It's filled with artifacts related to the logging industry, and I don't know what any of them are. And Ray was the person to drive over there and go through and identify all the different artifacts or the tools, explain how they were used and help. I think one of the, the resources, the best resources about this as association is its members. And we've got a couple people who are experts on tools, uh, a couple who are connected to blacksmiths, a couple that are really involved with railroads. And so if you're looking for a specific piece of information, what's nice about the Forest History Association is that we probably have somebody we can point you to, to get that information. Yeah, and there's, you know, thinking about local historical societies, there isn't a town in Wisconsin that has not been impacted by the forest industry at some point in their history. And so it's a matter of digging into your own history, doing some research, and then uh, getting a hold of us and maybe we can help you uh, dig a little deeper and find more information. So, but um, the whole state of Wisconsin at one time was forested and all of those resources were used at some point in history. So um, it's a matter of uh, doing a little research and working with us. So next question. Uh, do you have to be a member of the association to access all the information on our website? Um, okay, everything that we put on the website is available. We don't have a, you know, a special wall that separates members versus non-members. So when we make something available on the website, it is uh, available for free use by everyone. And as far as I know, that is the intention for as far down the road as we can go. We collect these things. Uh, we want to make them available to people to use them, whether it's for just personal research or if they're doing uh, some type of research related to a future writing project, we want the material out there for people to be able to use. Correct. It's part of our core mission to inform right. and educate. And so there's no restrictions. It's all available to everybody. And that's uh, what we consider part of our job. Uh, now on to the plans for the Peshtico conference and uh, what we'll be presenting as webinar and face-to-face -face programs. <coughs> Excuse me. So Peshtigo. Um Okay, well, as I mentioned in the talk, we're gonna have a few days of a few webinars leading up to Peshtigo conference. And then the plan is the Peshtigo conference will be a, you know, a drive-in event where people uh, drive to a Peshtigo uh, and lectures are given in person, face-to-face -face, uh, by different speakers. Uh, and I have a partial list of some of the speakers, but it's not in any way uh, finalized yet. So I'll just be quiet. Um, but I know that when it comes to the webinars, we have three webinars leading up to the actual conference. Those are, are set to be webinars. Um, and and that det those details be worked out as far as dates real quickly. Um, then the other parts of it are going to be in person. And, and, I, and I don't know if this is the, the focus of the question or not, but one of the things last year when we were planning the conference, we were planning for a face-to-face -face conference at Eagle River. And as we got closer because of COVID, everything switched to the webinars where everything was given by webinar. We're hoping that people are vaccinated, that we will be able to hold this conference in person as we've done in the past, but we don't have a crystal ball and so maybe as we approach the, the deadline or the date uh, for the event, something might change. And, and again, to keep people informed, the website, uh, the, the website and the Facebook page are probably the two ways that would be uh, getting information out to everybody 
And then for members, they would get a print copy of the newsletter where we would make a decision before the final newsletters went out so that they would know whether, whether the conference was just going to be webinars or both webinars and in person. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things about this conference that I'm really excited about, it's happening on the anniversary and it's a monumental history event in the state of Wisconsin. I mean, it was a big deal and it still is today and it's important to recognize that history and what happened, uh, learn about the conditions that led up to the fire and then the a tremendous uh, loss of human life and uh, the consequences of uh, that fire is just a fascinating story. And uh, we, like uh, Don said, we have lots of great speakers that are gonna uh, share that information. And it's gonna be, in, in my mind, it's gonna be a, a stellar event. Uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtual, it'll be really neat. And I'm really looking forward to it because like I said, it's it's an event like none other, and it was uh, very important to the history of Wisconsin. <coughs> Anything else, Don? Um, well, I do. I did want to <laughs> do one more little reminder. I kind of uh, want to get this out to people. Visit the Forest History Association wi.com website for information. We will keep things posted on there. Uh, and I encourage you to visit uh, and learn more about the Forest History Association. It's a really neat organization. You'll have a ton of fun. You'll meet a lot of neat people. Uh, I'd encourage you to learn about it also. So thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>